Hannah Gadsby, great to have you on the program. Thank you. Knowing that I was interviewing you made me think about stand-up comedy and actually when you think about it, what an incredible thing it is that a heap of people come into a room and they pay money and one person has to stand in front of them and make them laugh. It sounds on paper so terrifying to be the one person up the front. I mean, it's dumb. The whole thing is, is not smart. Uh, the, the concept seems very strange to me. Sometimes I'm behind the curtain before we, uh, uh, before we, it sends you mad as well, before I go on stage and I think, who are these people? Why are they here? What on earth am I doing? Luckily I get it together before I hit the mic, but um, it is a moment where you're just like, it's very odd and it's not something I was, I ever dreamed of doing. Um, I didn't think big when I was a kid. I think I wanted to be a dog originally, but, um, you know, performing wasn't part of my wheelhouse. It didn't, you know, I was from a small town, there wasn't theatre or anything like that. So how did you come to it then? Desperation. I, everything, I, I was really struggling. I'd done an art history degree, so that dead end. Uh, I was a cinema projectionist, another dead end. Um, and then I was working on a farm, planting trees. Um, that, that had a future, but um, it was quite hard work, and I just ended raw comedy. I don't think things through. Had I known how hard this job is, I probably wouldn't have signed up. So what happened when you entered raw comedy? Uh, I, I, won, I won it. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, I ended up winning it, which I think is partly... I think a lot to do with that was a fresh voice, because I had no idea what I was doing. I think that was part of the... So what did, you do, what did you base your show on? Well, so, stories I'd already told all throughout my life. They were like, you know when you're meeting people, you have your little set stories, and mine were always quite funny because I'd always had to explain myself, right, from my name uh, to where, you know, it's a palindrome. People love to tell you that as if you'd never thought of that before. So I already had material around that because, of course, I, I know how to spell my name. But it's amazing how often people just go, did you know? And um, so then, of course, I'm from Tasmania. Everyone has a whole, you know, run of jokes to tell me about that. So I had my responses to that. So it was all those sorts of things. Um, you know, being a fat, depressed lesbian, that always needs a, an explanation. People go, why would you choose that? It's like, well, you know, it's more fun than it looks. And what was it like when you stood in front of a room full of people for the first time and you told some of these stories and everyone laughed? It was wonderful because I speak quite softly and I've never been someone who holds a room, you know, I don't walk in a room and people say, oh, she's here. No. Uh, so I think the, the whole people listening to me was quite novel and the microphone helped, of course, and they, there's a structure to it. You know, I'm in f front of people and they, you know, they have to sit there. Usually if I'm talking to people, they'll walk away. Um, so I found that I was much more interesting than I thought I perhaps was. <laughs> who do you find funny? My mum is probably the funniest person I've ever met. Um, I, I've always found the funnier, my funniest interactions are from people I know. Um, you know, they're the ones that I lose it at. You know, and always, you know, um, my, my nan, when I was growing up, she was hilarious. You know, that twinkle in her eye. And that, I, that always really appealed to me, but, um, I always get stuck on this question, and every time someone says, "Who do you?" I, I think I should read. I should come up with a an answer to that, but uh, it doesn't look like I've done my research. You take that away and give it some good hard. I'm thought. not as um, I'm not as professional as yourself, <laughs> Lee. I don't do my research. Um, you said before that if you'd known how hard this job was, you would have thought twice about doing it. What do you mean by that? It is a lot of work uh, <laughs> for a start. And it doesn't look like it should be. But also, the, being a public figure is not, it's problematic. You have to, like I said before, you, you know, I developed a persona that then becomes my public self. And that, it's quite horrific how easily and how willing people are to tell you you're wrong just the way you are. And, you know, there's an idea of, you know, toughen up, which is fine, but I, I am, uh, I am a princess, I am a snowflake, uh, so th it does take a toll with me. So what, what do you mean people telling you that you're wrong? Oh, the abuse, okay, I cop abuse all the time, uh, and particularly when, you know, sort of online now is, you know, like people have access to you. Um, what, for, what for? Um, 
Sure. Well, I mean, uh, my body's wrong, apparently. Uh, um, all sorts of things. Um, you know, and I think it's... We, I know the theory behind all this, and you can just wipe it away, but I think it does. It gets boring after a while. When it's relentless, you know, every time you log on or whatever, somebody's got an opinion, it is hard to take sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And also, like, it's... Um, you know, most comedians who you talk to, they'll look out in the crowd and they will focus on that one person who's not laughing. And it's just a thing you do. Everyone's laughing and you go, hey, what's your problem? He's probably having a hard day. But um, that's, that's what you focus on. So when you're getting hatred online, you know, it is a, you know we all know the, the drill. Ignore the haters. But they get under your skin. And I think it's a, it's a very problematic exchange. Um, I'm not. I mean, I'm fine. Do you engage with it or do you just note, um, note it and move on? It, every day is a new day with me. Sometimes I engage, I tear them a new one. Um, the trick is when you engage with a troll, for instance, is not to be emotionally invested uh, and, and bait them until they're emotionally invested and you win. I'm quite good at it. Um, but it's not a, a good use of time uh, or, you know, your emotional resources. So I try not to. How do you learn how to control a room? It takes a long time, uh, to, but people are so well behaved. Like, there is a protocol to an audience. They sit down and they watch. And, unless, you know, so it's not like you have to herd cats to sit down. You know, that's all set up, so that's easy. Uh, they smell fear, I've noticed. So if you look nervous, then they're going to get nervous for you. Most, most of the time, people want, don't want you to do badly when you walk out on stage. They're like, we'd like this to go well. And I go, I'll do my best, and it's generally OK. It, it, in the UK, it's different. They really want to trip you up. Uh, so there's a bit more of a gladiatorial... So that, a bit more heckling and stuff. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, quite vile. Um, which I'm not really into, because I'm like, well, I don't really... I don't think we'd like each other. I might go home. Like, <laughs> I don't understand why you'd do that. But um, generally here... So it's, what I do, though... I think what holds people's attention is I tell stories. It, there's lots of jokes in what I do, but I generally tell stories. And stories are... It's a language we know, or everyone knows that. that. Uh, everyone knows how stories works, and we, you know, we like stories, so people are always engaged with those sorts of things. Um, and I think, because I, I talk slowly, I think that really captivates people. So, like, is she going to go to sleep? Well, do you know, you said before as well that you speak softly. That actually, I think, sometimes when I have been around soft talkers, it, you lean forward. Everyone has to listen a little yeah. bit harder. Yeah, I find I've really got to keep up on my oral hygiene there. <laughs> I've got to keep mints because people do lean in. <laughs> Maybe. See, if, if, you, if you could talk more low as well, so you could be slow, soft and low, that would be quite yeah. menacing. Yeah, drop my balls. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You'd start like in a David Mamet play or something, yeah. I think. That'd yeah, be I get cool. more roles. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying now. Is that better? Gangster. <laughs> Gangster for your next role. I'm I think. very tough. I'm very tough. Um, what do you think are the limitations of stand-up comedy as an art form? I think they're very limited, to be honest. Um, I've found what, over the course of my career I've been telling my story, um, I, you know, different parts of it and such. But I found... Um, that if you're stopping your story at the punchline, you're not getting the third act, almost. Like, the, the bit where something is quite nice you can share with people, but they're not interested, because they're like, go back to the trauma, that was funny. Go back to that bit where you're depressed. That's, I don't want to know that you, you, you've got a good relationship with your parents now. Go back to the bit where you don't, that's funny. And I just sort of think, that, you know, repeating that kind of formula can sort of suspend you almost in a perpetual state of adolescence. Uh, and I, I think I'm, I'm getting to the age where I'm like, oh, I'd like to, I'd like to evolve a little bit more now. So I think these stories, I think, have a capacity for uh, more, you know, interesting exploration. If you stop at the, at the laugh line, though, you, you're limiting yourself a lot. So how much have you had to edit or exaggerate um, things in order to make them work for comedy? Uh, with my own life, I've had to tone a lot down um, because I've had quite a, an adventure, partly to do with circumstance and also the way that I'm, I'm wired. I, make, I don't do decisions well. Um, you know, when I was in Edinburgh this year, I uh, was doing really well, but that wasn't enough, apparently, for my existence. So 
a wisdom tooth decided to impact and I got all sorts of face ache pain. Mm. And so I'm like, oh, this is almost a career high and I'm not going to enjoy it because of that. And I said this sentence out loud to someone. It's like that time when I was 15 and got selected to the Greg Norman Junior Golf Classic and got gallstones. <laughs> so that's... <laughs> <laughs> you can't make that up, but also if you set it on stage, they go, you've made that up, it's so silly. So that's, that's how my life has been. Stuff has happened that, um, you know, I've been hit by five cars because I'm a bit vague, but that's too much, isn't it? So I've toned it down to well, see, three. See, if, if you gave me that in a book and a piece of fiction and I were your editor, I'd say, oh, Hannah, just sort of not believable, a bit too much, let's make it maybe two bike accidents. Yeah, and... yeah, and you die. <laughs> 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 what um, is the impact um, on you of telling a story night after night that you've had to leave out, as you say, perhaps a key part of the story, the resolution or, or, of it or whatever, and you've perhaps had to skew it in a way that makes it work for, for an audience? I, I think there's two ways that that... What we understand about storytelling and memory and uh, overcoming trauma is that you can shape your memories to a positive uh, and, you know, so it has less impact in your day now. So when you look back, instead of feeling sad about what happened, you can develop a better or a more robust view of your memory. Um, and so staying up in a way, if you're telling a story that perhaps is, is cloaked in, in a bit of trauma, it can improve the way you look at it because you're getting laughter and applause and feeling connected to the audience. So that, in that sense, it can, it can actually help. It certainly helped me in some parts of my life where I'm like, you know, I'm laughing, or people are laughing with me about something that's bothered me. But on the same hand, and this is particularly true at the moment with um, sort of uh, my sexuality and uh, coming out, uh, because that happened in Tasmania, sort of around the debate around legalising gay marriage. I mean, sorry, <laughs> legalising uh, homosexuality. Um, I'm comparing that to now, where we're, all of a sudden I'm a debatable citizen again, with gay marriage, um, I've realised that the way that I've told my story, making it, you know, funny and like it's resolved, suddenly hit me very hard, the way that this debate's being handled and it's very familiar to how it was handled when I was a kid. And I think perhaps as a storyteller, I have a responsibility to tell it better because I think I paid a price for a lesson Australia hasn't learnt. What is the price that you think you've paid? When, when the debate was raging in Tasmania, uh, you know, ignorance was being stirred up. Basically, uh, I grew up homophobic, because that's, uh, you know, northwest coast of Tasmania was quite... 80%, I think, of the population was... Uh, believed that homosexuality should remain illegal. So that's my... That was what I grew up. And, you know, there wasn't... There wasn't uh, social media, but, you know, the... Letters to the editor was, you know, slow Twitter. I was on the radio. So my whole childhood was sort of, that was, that was the chat. And the price I paid for that was twofold. A, as, you know, people were given permission to see me as less, to treat me as less or my type as less. But also the other part of that is I was taught to hate myself and think that I was less. And when that happens to adolescents, they, uh, adole there is, you know, it's not, an, it's not a good start to life. You take a lot longer to become a constructive citizen. You know, put you behind the eight ball. And that's what happened to me. And it was nobody's fault, you know. Like, I think when I was younger, I probably could have gone, you know, said, you know, laid blame. But as I got older, it's like, it's how it happened, you know. I, I thought it perhaps was my family, but of course not. It was, you know, the government used it as, a, as an issue. So, given that context, will you, will you participate in the plebiscite? Uh, well, I'll vote. But also, I'm tired. I am... This shouldn't be happening. What we're doing is we're asking a, a minority to basically prove ourselves worthy of the majority. And that's not... That's not fundamentally what democracy is about. Uh, a minority is by virtue of being a minority on the outside, on the, out, on the outer. And so it's a vulnerable position already. And so to make us subject to a majority vote, 
uh, means that we have to we have to prove ourselves worthy, um, and that that's exhausting. Uh, and I, but I think it's also unfair for those who oppose gay marriage, you know, because the no vote comes with it now a lot of a lot of stigma, you know, and, and that these people are being dragged out, and you know, because they know they want to say publicly why they want to vote no, and their ideas are steeped in ignorance. But what I don't doubt is what informs their need to say no or speak out, and that's just general concern. And who am I to doubt why people are concerned about what's happening, you know? Parents are concerned about the way children are taught about gender and sexuality, and that, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. I think that's good to be concerned. What is not right is that it's placed on me. You know, that this the fundamental assumption that I um, I don't want to be a constructive citizen. I'm out to ruin stuff. Like you know this, you know, and I think I think all of us, every single one of us, that uh, ultimately just doing the best we can. We do want to be. We do want to create a good, safe community for children. Uh, and yet we found ourselves in this debate where we're apparently in opposition. And I just don't think that's necessarily true. Do you think? there would be any comfort for the minority if the majority were to vote overwhelmingly yes? I don't think this, this plebiscite has been set up to change anything. So I think it, a no vote would be devastating, but I'm not sure the yes vote will do anything. I think the damage is being done. In the last year since the first plebiscite, uh, was tabled, I've seen a dramatic increase in people's freedom to be hateful toward me and other. So my, again, all of a sudden, my sexuality is, is, a, is a place where people can put quite destructive uh, stuff into the world. Uh, and that, that, that does have an impact, it, not just for the minority, it's also teaching, you know, if you want to look at it, we're teaching our, you know, children to exclude, that to exclude is a democratic right. And I, I think a much better way of, uh, you know, organising, you know, these kinds of cultural shifts is to talk about the importance of inclusion. Uh, for me, on the outside, you know, being excluded has a problem, but I also know that the power that comes when you include someone is really important. Like, to say to, you know, that part of is missing from the debate. It's like, would you like, would you like these people to be equal? So with this very acclaimed show that you've been doing, Nanette, um, how have you married these sorts of things that you've been thinking about with stand-up comedy? Um, it's basically a divorce. Yeah, I've destroyed, I've destroyed the institution of marriage in my life. <laughs> um, yeah, I, in this show I've, I've shown, you know, I, I'm talk, in this show I generally, uh, is about the limitation of comedy. Um, I mean, when we, when we laugh, you know, it's uh, that idea, it's good for, good for you, laughter is the best medicine. Um, but when all our tensions are different. When I make people laugh, you know, make light of homophobia, I relieve other people's tensions. But I, I'm still quite tense. Uh, so I wonder, you know, this show's about, you know, what sort of, what, what am I doing, really? That's existential. So, it's based, yeah, the show is, is really, uh, you know, I'm destroying my, my career on but, stage. But you're not, letting, <laughs> um, you're not letting the audience off the hook by giving them a gag and then moving on? No, I give them lots of gags, but then I put them on the hook. What reaction, if indeed you are looking for a specific reaction, are you looking for from the audience? Um, I, I'm... Uh, Prior to this show, you know, I think what I've become really good at is controlling the room. I know how to make people laugh when I want them to laugh, and I'm really good at holding silences in the room. 
Um, what I'm doing in this show, though, is I, I'm, I'm appealing to people's humanity. So I don't want to win them over with jokes. I don't want to win them over with my opinion. I just want to tell my story. Um, and by losing, you know, the humour out of it, I'm giving people a chance to think as individuals. And when you think as an individual in a room full of people, it's quite, it's quite a, uh, a strange thing because we used to either laughing or, or, or agreeing or, you know, like when you look at, you know, it's the preaching to the choir idea. And because laughter or anger and all these things, they're, you know, they connect people. So you can, in a room full of people, you can think things that you wouldn't if you were on your own. I've seen comedians make a room full of people laugh about, about things that I find horrific. You know, I'm standing backstage and I'm listening to a guy on stage tell, making a room full of people laugh about sexual assault. And I'm backstage because I'm not in the, you know, in the environment of the room where, you know, the audience becomes one. And I'm standing backstage going, do they know they're laughing at sexual assault? And I honestly don't think they do because it's, you know, that's what laughter does. But even when you were saying before about early in your career how you talked about, um, well, you had to feel like you'd explain being a depressed lesbian, which I'm sure people probably laughed at. I think in real life, if my gay friend said to me, I'm really depressed, I certainly wouldn't find it funny. Well, I think there's, in real life, there's real power in the humour, you know, to do it with humour and, you know, because that, you know, when you talk about things with such weight, it doesn't do anything. In fact, it weighs you down more, you know, to do it, to, to talk about those things with a friend with lightheartedness or the attempt at humour is an attempt to connect. But we're living in a, a very uh, uh, uneven uh, world at the moment. So when I stand on stage, I'm, I'm a second class citizen trying to make, you know, there's, you know, straight people laugh. I'm, I'm not interested in making them feel better anymore. And what do you hear in the audience when you're doing this show? Well, it's been the wonderful thing. I've decided to, you know, not pull my punches and uh, it's been received so well. And that's been, uh, that's been a real saving grace uh, in my view of, you know, what's going on with the gay marriage debate because I, you know, did lose heart. But, uh, you know, standing up, speaking my truth, appealing, you know, because I think often with these things we're talking about, you know, people pull out facts and then dispute facts. And I've, I've no, I don't think fact. Well, I think it's, you know, facts are fairly limited in how they can influence people. Uh, I think if you can tell a story, and I've told my story truthfully now, and I believe that I've, I've changed, well, not changed people's minds, but I've definitely, they see it as a human problem, not as a, you know statistical or uh, thing and I think that sometimes is missing in the way we talk about issues. There's an emotional and a human connection then after they've heard a story. Yeah and uh, I know we like to think that we're all objective but I really you know we are we are messy humans and I think it's important to tell your story. It, well I found it better to be uh, messy with my story this time. It sounds like, you know, even if it hadn't been well received, you still would have found it personally a useful exercise. No. Really? No. If I'd have told that this story truthfully and it not been, you know, if it had been rejected in the room, no, I would have stopped. I would have adjusted. And that, because that's what I do. You know, that's what being a comedian is. You read the room. There's a subtle art. You, although the script doesn't change, there's always a subtle art where you're going... Your people, I'm losing the audience. I've got to change up, whether that's pacing, or time, you know, the timing of jokes, or lose that story, tell another one. And I would have done that early on in this process. And certainly, when I first started doing it, um, I was being, I got some horrific heckles, um, and that process, you know, informed how I adjust the show. But it, the response emboldened me, and I think had the response be less, I would have not. I mean, no, this, only so far I'll put my neck out. What has it meant then that the response hasn't just been positive, it's been unbelievable? You know, you've won all these awards and I've seen, you know, the headlines exhilarating and incredible reception. Um, it's, it's been very, uh, very constructive to me, to my feeling uh, like I belong. So that, that's been wonderful. It's also been 
a lovely thing uh, because it feels there's a lot of ego associated with stand up because it's you know just one person controlling a room. It's very easy to go oh, check me out. Although I was brought up to really doubt my own importance. So thanks, Mum and Dad, really, <laughs> really kept my ego in check, um, which I think is good. But this show is by far my most successful. But uh, I can safely say that I've attached less importance to what I've done because it feels like it's bigger than me. I've touched, tapped into a zeitgeist. I'm saying things that perhaps people have thought, you know, like it's appealing to something that I think is bigger than me and beyond me. So um, in that sense, it's been a very, you know, it sounds like a prime wanker, but humbling, you know, like it's like, but also connected, more connected to the, you know, I, the world I live in. I was reading um, in a article about you that you asked who is Nanette, which I'm sure you get asked in every interview, and you said um, that she was a cranky old barista that you once met. But I must say, when I read it, I thought, in every interview, is she trolling people? Is she going, oh, she was a Westfield parking attendant that I met one time. Oh, she was, you know, a shoe saleswoman. Um, are you trolling us all? Uh, <laughs> no, I originally was going to... Was, I wasn't going to do this show. I was really struggling about what to talk about on stage because, you know, comedy is about being sort of an everyday person, someone accessible. But uh, I was running out of things to talk about because, you know, I'm not normal. And I've lived a very abnormal life. And the older I get, the less touchstones I have. Because I can't... Don't you, don't you love it? Love it when your husband... Oh, no. <laughs> oh you know when you... Ki oh, you know when you like... It? Oh. Um, so none of these things, are, you know... You know, and when you're younger, there's that sort of... Everyone knows what it is to negotiate the world, but I'm dead inside now, so that's not fun on stage. So I was struggling with the subject matter, and I was originally going to write a show all about the colour blue, because um, <laughs> I'm... Uh, and I'd... Uh, I called it Nanette, because I had met... She was a brister in a petrol station uh, in Western Australia, of all places, and she was just the most un nanette type person. Um, so then I stopped thinking about blue and started thinking about, I reckon, because I, I, I really worried about Nanette because I knew she hated me, um, but I, don't, I didn't take it personally because, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a city folk. Right. And she's, you know, you could see it. She's probably not that old, but she'd seen her life, you know, and she's a barista now. Like, she's probably 60, 70, and she's a barista, and I just felt so sad for her because, you know, she, A, shouldn't be working in a petrol station, or if she does, but she should be making instant coffee. You know, I thought too much about this woman called Nanette, you know? Like, why is she, why is she in a petrol station being a barista? That's, that's not, that's not right, is it? So does she actually come up in the show? No. Or she's just, that was just a device oh, to get you th thinking oh, about it. stuff? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, spoiler alert. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, because oh, the thing about shows is, you know, I had to, you know, when you tour it in festivals, they go, right, you need a name and you need to, a blurb, and so you make stuff up. <laughs> and uh, and then you go, you have to try. But there wasn't that much material. You've performed this show a lot now. How do you bring every night to it a, a freshness and, an, and a genuine level of emotion? Uh, that's, it's different for this show than it has been in the past. I think in the past, that's a... That's an interesting question in the art form. With this show, though, because it is different uh, and it is... It, each audience is its own, it gets shocked every night. I'm not shocked, but is it... I am aware that what I do in this show has an impact with the audience and I can sense that on stage, so I think that, that brings the freshness to it. I get... Uh, uh, I'm quite vulnerable in this show, so that that's fresh. Um, so there's all sorts of things, but ordinarily, uh, I think there's a there's a sweet spot when you do a show, uh, and the sweet spot is once you know it well and you've got the rhythm of it, that you're not bored. But I don't think I'll ever get bored of this show. Uh, it's not uh, that kind of show, but I'm I might get it might wear me down because it's so honest and there's as you say the degree of vulnerability in it 
does it feel still like a performance or does it feel like you're just telling a story? Um, I don't, I've not had a lot of training in performance. So I, I actually think I'm missing something that I've always miss, been missing that protection. That's, you know, where you put the mask on. So, um, so I, I think, yeah, the, this show particularly has, um, you know, ground me down, but it's also uplifted me. So it's, a, it's, a, it's like nothing else I've done before. Yeah. You mentioned before um, that you hoped you didn't sound like a wanker. I want to ask you about wankers. I want to ask you about art. Okay. <laughs> um, you hosted a show in 2014 on art um, and because, as you mentioned, you studied art history um, and you tried to talk accessibly about art, you know, not, not in a funny way, just an, in, in an accessible way. Why has so much wanky language sprung up around art when art really is a very simple and practical and beautiful thing? It's, um, I think it, it boils down, there was a time when we all understood what art was doing because it was about storytelling. You know, you look at a painting of Adam and Eve, you know the story. The painting doesn't depict the entire story. It's almost sim symbolic of the ho what we know. Uh, and then modern art sort of broke that to pieces a little bit and, and so at that point, art became a second language, sort of like Latin. Um, and art talked about art and became uh, a little bit more inaccessible. And then there was a whole, you know, there's a, it's a whole different world. It, it, you know, you talk about art, why it's worth something, why that's important, even though a normal person will go, well, my eight-year-old does stuff like that. And then, so <laughs> there's that, there's that, that gap. Um, but what hasn't changed, and what I love about art, is that artists, although the, the language that people use is different, the visual language is different, the questions are the same from way back thousands of years ago to now. And uh, I, you know, I love to bridge that gap. People feel intimidated uh, in galleries and, and, you know, not knowing, you know, they feel like, oh, perhaps I'm wrong. Chances are they are, but so are the wankers. Um, and, you know, it's all that uh, idea of, you know, the questions are the important things. And you look at then how people, you know, how artists are answering them now. Um, so, yeah, I, I love art. It's a great way to learn about the world, I think. So what is next for you? Uh, Missed lunch, haven't I? Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, this interview's gone so long. It's my bad. <laughs> um, well, I'm working on a documentary at the moment. I'm trying to tie that, tie that up. About art? Yeah, about oh. the nude in art. So, um, I've, I'm sort of uh, writing a book, trying to finish. I'm finishing off a lot of things. Uh, yeah, a book. So that, that'd be nice, maybe a book tour. Are you getting a break or are you just going to keep um, chugging along? You know because I have to generate my own work and that sort of stuff, a break is quite frightening because you go, oh, maybe I'll, I'll never work again. Um, but, you know, because I move so slowly through life, like I seem very busy and I am doing a lot of things, but, you know, I take nana naps. <laughs> well, look, if you never work again, it's been good having you on the show this one time at least. Yeah, so. career highlight. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks.